史长河。十二。Human history, like a river, will keep moving forward with moments of both calm waters and huge waves. We have before us the opportunity to forge a new world order. The problem with modern-day unipolarity is precisely like that. The West is the leading. Ukraine down the Primrose Path. We don't have enough tanks. We don't have enough vessels. We don't have enough planes to bring chip production here to the U.S. This is multipolarity, charting the rise of the new multipolar world order. Coming up this week, broken Britain. The FT has published some data that suggests the United Kingdom is essentially Romania with Singapore attached, an island of London prosperity. Weighed to regions that, in some cases, are poorer than the poorest U.S. state, Mississippi. It highlights the way that deindustrialization and regional disparities are starting to fracture even developed economies. So, is Britain about to become the first de-developing economy? Yet somehow, the country's property market is still only the twelfth most overheated in the world, with places like New Zealand and Czechia reporting much worse earnings to house price ratios. We're considering whether it really is a crisis in house supply, as we've been told, that's ratcheted prices since the millennium, or is it something much harder to amend? A Chinese province is repealing its hukou laws, the rules restricting where citizens can move to and settle within the country. Have they gone cuckoo with hukou, or is this a population equivalent of the financial big bang? But first. The genie in the bottle. Yeah, so、uh, the Financial Times had a story、um, this week. The title of it was "Is Britain Really as Poor as Mississippi?" And there was a very nice chart in it which showed GDP per capita, PPP adjusted. So it was properly done,、uh, th- th- thankfully, because we've had some issues with comparing wealth between countries recently,、um, which we've discussed on the podcast. So it is properly done. Um, and it's showing that、um, that not only is the UK national average、uh, per capita GDP pretty poor relative to competitor nations in Europe and also the United States, but the dispersion of this、um, per capita GDP between、um, areas, regions, or cities in Britain is really, really extreme.、Um, And none of this is particularly shocking, but seeing it kind of statistically presented is quite nice.、Um, London stands up、uh, in terms of its per capita GDP,、um, where you'd expect kind of a modern,、uh, developed capital. So you can see it there, tracking with kind of Frankfurt, Stuttgart, not quite as wealthy as Munich, certainly as wealthy as Amsterdam, Los Angeles, Chicago,、uh, not quite as wealthy as Seattle, Boston, New York City. Um, but then、uh, below that, the next、uh, largest city is Edinburgh, which is way down,、um, pretty much close to the national average in Germany. So this is a wealthy city in Scotland that has a lot of banking, deals with North Sea oil, and so on. If you go there, you wouldn't you wouldn't think of it as a poor place. You'd think of it as an impressive city. And of course, it's the second. Uh, most it's the second richest city in the UK, yet it's sitting down, you know, in the general average in Germany, and it's sitting far below the general average in the United States. It's、uh, so Edinburgh sits around where around below Texas as a whole, and around on par with Florida. And of course, Florida will have some rich cities like Miami. Texas will have a very rich city like Houston and Dallas. But the but to see a city, a rich city like Edinburgh, sit down there with an entire state, inclusive of all the poor regions in Florida, of which there are many,、um, of all the poor regions in Texas, which there are certainly many,、um, is kind of really shocking. And actually, and and then of course the the highlight of the entire show was really compa- the comparison to Mississippi in the U.S.、Um, what the What the data was showing is that the、uh, per capita GDP PPP adjusted、uh, in Mississippi, which we kind of associate with a very, very poor and backward, backward place in the United States, that's really comparable to a developing country in some ways.、Um, but the data seems to be showing that it's it's wealthier than the West Midlands, it's wealthier than Yorkshire, it's wealthier than the Northeast. And just to give some context to that. Um, there is nowhere in the Netherlands that is as poor as Mississippi. 
And in Germany, um, one of the places that, that is, is poorer than Mississippi is it, there are very few of them. And it's Saxony Anhalt, which my understanding of it is, um, is a, 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 a poor region from Eastern, Ger- East Germany that never really caught on with the, with the boom and, and never really developed. So if we take the numbers at face value and we can discuss them further, um, if we should, um, this po- point uh, paints a really, really bleak picture of Britain. Not only is it kind of falling behind as a whole, but um, it's really just just London that's 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 powering ahead. Maybe Edinburgh and the southeast, and everything else really just isn't keeping up with the rest of the developed world. The first thing I would say is I bow to nobody in my degree of despair at this uh, story. It's something that I've been following for a while. I think the very first time that you and I did any sort of broadcast, it was a spaces, uh, Philip, and you know we both decided we should turn this into a podcast somehow, and we spoke about exactly this issue, or you know maybe a year or so ago now, that Britain is in. I mean, I call Britain the first uh, demerging economy. I mean, we have the modern word for third world is kind of emerging economy or frontier economy. And, Britain is the first demerging economy. It's the first economy that's going downward. And in a lot of ways, you, you know, you do see, um, third world type, uh, third world type, uh, signals within Britain. So one of those would be, um, that there is a huge wealth gap between rich and poor. Uh, another one would be there's huge regional inequalities. So you have London and the rest, which, This demonstrates uh, very clearly. And that's very much the case in third world economies. You know, if you look at the difference between Lagos and the rest of Nigeria, you'll know exactly what I mean, or or the Rio and Sao Paulo area and the rest of Brazil, perhaps. You know, you have these regions which are really the center of the country, whereas in developed economies, you have wealth right throughout a country. Uh, And then there are also things like... um, the number of people on very low wages and insecure wages, which feeds into, of course, the uh, income inequality as well. It's also a very low productivity economy now, you know, which is a, again, a great signifier of a, of a less than developed economy is a low degree of productivity, especially when you consider the fact that we don't have a, a large agriculture sector like the French or the, the, the Ukrainians or the Russians or, I mean, even the Germans have a larger agriculture sector than us. So this is something that I've been following for quite some time. It is not something I'm surprised to see at all, as depressing as it is to see on a on a pink piece of paper, as we did in the Financial Times recently. One thing I would say about the comparison, though, just one thing that perhaps is a little bit unfair. Both the United States and Germany are quite new countries that were formed on a federal basis. I mean, even... You know, during the Bismarck uh, Reich, it, you know, it was a, you know, formed from a, a series of city states and kingdoms that were independent at the time. Um, and obviously post war, it was formed on a federal system as well with quite strong, uh, regional identities and specific regional economies and, and a quite a distributed, um, and, uh, devolved, uh, government structure. Uh, the same is true, of course, in the United States, where you have individual states and very heavily devolved government where uh, state governors and even municipal uh, governments through, you know, mayoralties uh, have quite a, a, you know, a substantial amount of uh, political power. And of course, the Netherlands, it, you know, it's quite a small country. It's quite densely populated. You have that kind of that horseshoe from from uh, Rotterdam and the Hague round to Amsterdam, where a huge portion of the population live. So um, perhaps it's a little bit unfair to compare a country like, you know, Britain to that. You know, I think France would have been a more interesting comparison because, you know, you very much have Paris and then the rest. and You know, Marseille might match up nicely with Manchester, for example, or Liverpool. But still, it's a very depressing thing to read. And I, I mean, not surprising at all. Yeah, I'm actually totally with you on that. The the comparison seemed uh, slightly arbitrary in a sense. Why the Netherlands? Why? I mean, Germany, you could say, okay, it's the biggest uh, country in Europe, but why the Netherlands? Not really specified. Why not Spain? Why not Italy? Italy is famously regional income inequality. I mean, the north and south of Italy are effectively different countries. 
That's um, all right. You, you so know, you have the 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 Po Valley area, and then you have the Metagiono, and the then the gap between the two is absolutely huge, right? Like the Metagiono is quite heavily kind of developing world, whereas that kind of northern Italy and Lombardy and all of that kind of area is a real economic powerhouse of kind of German standards, I would say, right? Well, the the infamous Lega Nord, it means the Northern League, right? It's it, it was a party founded to say we we should break away from the South because they're they're poor and uh, we don't want to have anything to do with them. We're rich and we're different people. In a sense, they speak the same language, but we're different people. So, um, so I do kind of, I, I actually really do question that. And and honestly, the the FT um, is a good paper, but some of its data work recently looks a little bit cherry picking for headlines. I, I have to call it. It's been that way for about five years now. The other issue with them, I think, is probably the, and I think you alluded to it earlier, is the um, is the income inequality. Uh, angle on this um and this is where where um thing where the red flags go up in my mind about something like mississippi i'm sorry i don't believe that mississippi number mississippi is genuinely a poor place that 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 just is the reality it has not developed into some into somewhere uh, on par with manchester i mean go to manchester it's it's okay it's not the richest city in the world it's got its problems but it's it's not it's not kind of this quasi developing country um and i'm sorry to say it but parts of mississippi or majority of mississippi is is like that so i think what this speaks to is is income inequality the fact of the matter is that just because per capita gdp is very high if an awful lot of that income is just accruing to a small group of people then it's not comparing like with like um, so, you know, I looked at the very basic statistics on it. Um, they're, they're called Gyni coefficients. Britain uh, as a whole, I can't get Manchester, unfortunately, it's, it hasn't been done to my knowledge. But uh, Britain as a whole is, is sitting a bit, uh, at about 36%. And Mississippi is pretty close to 49%. And if you understand how these metrics are constructed, um, the difference between 36 and 49 is enormous because you, you, you'll you never, as you approach 100% on this, it doesn't really get any higher. I think the high, I think the most unequal country in the world is South Africa and, and the coefficient is something like 60%. Right, the, you know, 49%, just to give listeners a, a, a view on what that means. Um, the closest country I could uh, catch to that was uh, the Republic of Congo. Um, so... That gives people some sort of idea. And I mean, even Saudi Arabia, where you would imagine there would be a huge uh, degree of inequality, given you have the royal family and then a, uh, you know, a, a large number of people beneath that kind of Crocean wealth. Even Saudi Arabia is less unequal than Mississippi. Saudi Arabia's uh, Gini coefficient is only 46. So that, I mean, uh, apologies again to interrupt, but that just to give listeners a little bit of context there. That's right. I mean, we're pushing 50% in Mississippi and a 50% coefficient is just enormous. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's closer to the most unequal country in the world, which is South Africa, than it is to Britain. So I'm sorry, that, that, that's not an apples to apples comparison at that point. Um, so, so I don't think this is really saying what the statistician wanted it to say. I think, as you say, there was cherry picking of some of the examples that have happened here. But in saying that, I don't think it's completely worthless. And as you say, we've we discussed this very early on um, when when we met, I suppose, and it is a serious issue. Well, it is. And notwithstanding those quibbles, and I think they are really quibbles because this demonstrates something very important. And the important thing that it demonstrates is that Britain really is starting to dip out of developed world status. And I know that might sound a little bit apocalyptic or a little bit um a little bit of an embellishment in some way, but I really don't think it is. As I mentioned before, you know, some of the metrics about regional inequalities as is discussed in this report, but also uh, overall degree of inequality and um, the lack of um, median and mode wage growth, the fact that there's a large number of uh, gig work, an increasing amount of gig work, an increasing amount of job insecurity and low wage work, the fact that we've really desperately struggled with inequality and, and a range of other metrics. 
I mean, Britain is still a developed economy. It's still a relatively rich economy, but certainly it's seeing its overall standards of living, its overall level of wealth, its overall contributions, really, uh, declining quite frighteningly. And when you compare that to some countries, say, in Eastern Europe, places like the Czech Republic, like Poland, where you know we used to see them as a source of low-cost labor, that gap really is narrowing very quickly. And unfortunately, I, you know, I see the British economy, it seems quite grotesquely deformed to me on a whole range of different uh, axes, not just one or two axes, but a few. It seems to me in quite a precarious position. It seems to me quite likely that we could see another quite serious depre- uh, recession, which would knock a significant amount off the off wealth and off living standards again. Unfortunately, I don't see this changing at all. I, I think there's some quite hard times on, on the way for British people. Yeah, I'd add to that that I don't think a lot of the people who kind of form the intellectual elite or the, you know, uh, media aristocracy or policy-making aristocracy or whatever you want to call them, actually understand this. I, I'll never forget um, uh, I, I, a friend of mine who's grown up and lived all his life in North London uh, asked me once, you know, is do you think as an economist it's really true that Ireland is now substantially more wealthy than Britain, which is what the, uh, what the statistics show? And he said, because I went to Dublin, and uh, no offense, but uh, it doesn't really compare to London. And I said to him, the, the reason for this is because the wealth is relatively spread out in Ireland. Um, Dublin is wealthier than the rest of the country, but it, it's, you know, places like Limerick, which is a very a reasonably small city out in the, out in the um, West Coast, are they actually do have um, relatively high levels of wealth. So it's quite dispersed. And I said to him that if you go out to the regions, you'll see some very pretty towns, some very wealthy towns. But if you get off at the wrong train station, you'll be shocked at what you see. And he kind of said, well, I've never really done that. And for a variety of reasons, I quite like nature. I have done that. And I've got off occasionally at the wrong train station. And you really just look at it and you say, wow, this place is like really, really poor. So I just add to that that I don't think actually a lot of people in London are even aware of what's going on in other parts of the country. They, they only know it as like, going to some lovely um, town or village that that is known for its tourism, so it's beautiful, and they never see the kind of random diaspora, you know? Yeah, that's 100% right. I mean, it's somebody from the Northeast and somebody who is interested in uh, quite considerably in uh, economic renewal of the North and the Midlands and who follows this quite seriously. I, I can say 100% that, you you know, if you go to certain towns and and and, and the places in the Midlands and, and in the north of England as well, you'd be quite shocked about what you see in, in, in terms of the quality of transport infrastructure, in terms of the quality of housing, um, in terms of the sense of um, dispiritedness and, and kind of, you know, crushed hope and, and, and the general rundown, dilapidated, slightly unkempt kind of nature of it all. And I know that sounds, you know, maybe a bit fussy in a, you know, anybody who's read any kind of David Goodhart with his anywheres and somewheres theory, or anybody who's more recently read uh, M- Matthew Goodwin's work, you know, will understand that there is, you know, the people who run politics, both on the political side and the civil service side, and also the kind of the, the media class and the chattering classes at large, really don't have a clue about how things are outside the M25. It's it, it's really quite shocking. But um, one of the things, though, Philip, that does make life harder in Britain is the high cost of housing. Uh, in some places now, the cost of houses are seven or eight times or even nine times uh, annual income, you know, average cost of houses versus average annual income, which is really quite a painful level, level and locks a lot of people out of the housing market. but you have a different theory about this because the big argument tends to be you know from say my end of the economic spectrum we believe that the problem is that the government and local councils have got out of the business of house building britain doesn't build any council houses anymore um and perhaps that's also true of the us and maybe europe as well as we've shifted a little bit rightward 
economically since the 1980s. On the other side of the ledger, you've got the more kind of uh, right of center or libertarian view that the problem is actually the NIMBYs, the not in my backyard sort who don't want building anywhere. And the fact that government planning is just too onerous. And if you just liberal liberalize that, you know, people would come and start building lots of houses and we could increase the supply of houses and reduce, um, and reduce the cost because demand would stay the same. But you've got a different view, Philip. You think both of those theories are wrong and that actually it's something else entirely. Why don't you walk us through that? The house always wins. I published an article on Unheard this week, and I think it was probably the most controversial article I've ever written, which is quite strange. Yeah, which is we... saying something because, yeah, like usually I read the comments on your Unheard articles and they are, they're furious, Philip, they're furious. Well, a certain number of people get furious when you suggest that the world might not look like it currently looks in 10 years. A lot more people get furious when you talk about housing. So um, it's clearly uh, upping the stakes. I really was surprised at how controversial it was, although I'll circle back to that because it is kind of part of part of my argument in a sense. Um, yeah, as you say, the, uh, the way that um, the housing debate is framed is effectively that this is a supply side issue. That is that for whatever reason, more houses than are currently being built need to be built. Now, I will say to the extent that that is true, I I don't believe the NIMBY people. It's clearly, if you look at the statistics, the full on house building is clearly uh, council and uh, the housing association. So so basically, the, the underlying argument is that it's, it's all a supply side issue, um, but I think that there are an awful lot of problems with that argument. I, I mean, the first thing, I don't want to kind of um, disparage an argument just because of the motivations underlying it, but there is a lot of kind of sunk capital in this argument. It supports a lot of people in a sense, right? So first of all, the, the building lobby um, is really happy with this argument because it means that they can lobby whether to build more council housing or to build more or to get the regulations down. And it's, to my mind, it's kind of a one, two punch to get more stuff built uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the argument. The other aspect of the argument is that, um, I got interested in economics because I lived, uh, through the Irish housing, the great Irish housing boom and bust of 2007, well, 2006, 2007, 2008. And I actually worked in the property sector at the time um, while I was still in university. Um, and that's why I became fascinated by it because it was so obviously a bubble to me and everyone was denying it. Um, and what was really striking is that bubbles need a narrative um, to keep going. Um, and, and last time around during the crazy bubble, the one that was really exuberant um, in, up in the run up to 2008, it was very much kind of a speculative uh, argument about house flipping, about getting rich quick. And so it was much more obviously a bubble. Yet this time around, we've seen very similar runs up in prices and valuations, but it's been, it hasn't been justified by the same speculative mania. Now, on paper, the same speculative mania is going on because the prices are rising as fast and they're rising as high relative to incomes or rent or anything else. But the, the, the justification behind it is actually more publicly spirited, shall we say. The previous justification was greed. This time it's the common good, apparently. Um, so that kind of makes me suspicious of the argument, not, not because it, it, um, it, it uh, justifies those groups, but because we see the same dynamics happening again. <laughs> I remember this stuff. I remember this run up in housing prices. And I remember the housing prices starting to dip, as we're seeing once again, when interest rates uh, start to start to rise. So, so what do I think this is all about? Okay, I'll lay out my argument, and then, Andrew, you can say that I'm wrong, and then I'll try and explain a little bit more why I think there's evidence to support this. I think, I think that, the, um, that the housing market is not actually uh, driven by supply and demand dynamics, not at any reasonable level, maybe at the very extremes. If you wipe out 100% of the housing stock or 99%, it'll have an effect on prices. If you increase it by 100%, it may have an effect on prices. But in the real world, the supply and demand dynamics don't make that much of a difference. Housing is basically priced like an asset. It's priced like a stock or a bond. 
it, it, it's treated as, as an investment asset. And the reason for that is it is an investment asset in a very real sense. If you buy property, you get additional income in two ways. Well, first, of all, not quite income. You get income in the form of rents and you get capital gains in the terms of price, in terms of price appreciation. So um, you can also calculate what the, what the rent is going to give you relative to the price. That's called a rental yield. And then, and so that'll be your baseline uh, income, like almost like you're a dividend from your stock or like your interest coupon from a bond. And then the capital gains will be the price appreciation that you'll project over the time. And you'll go and you'll read the newspaper and they'll tell you what the latest is. It's going to grow by 3% a year for the next 10 years or whatever. And you'll take those calculations into account and you'll price the asset like this. So why has housing become more and more of an asset? First of all, because the economy has become increasingly financialized. Second of all, because we have huge pools of capital concentrating at the top of society. Two, two trends are driving that increased income inequality, wealth inequality, really, and aging population. Aging population leads to these big pools of capital as well. Finally, related to these two trends is extremely low interest rates, extremely exuberant stock markets that are jittery, that could collapse at any moment. These things scare people. You, you, you're not getting, you're, you see these overstretched stock and bond markets up until recently. Obviously, they've started unwinding again. You see these overstretched stock and bond markets, you're not getting a great return for them. The risk reward on it is terrible. And what that does is in, in a very real way, it makes people go out and purchase bricks and mortar as an alternative investment. And that can be anyone from the, 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 uh, uh, the, a, a normal couple that are entering their retirement, going to their financial advisor and their financial advisor saying stock and bonds aren't great right now. And they go, hmm, should we buy a second home and put little Johnny in it and pretend that he's the owner? Yeah, maybe you should. And then it goes right up to private equity industry. The private equity industry is getting massively involved in home purchases. And the private equity industry is taking pension fund money or ultra high net worth money or whatever else you want, and then it's going and it's going into those markets. So you're seeing it from all angles. So that makes a fair bit of sense to me. I think I follow quite seriously the the explosion, I suppose, of the last 15 or 20 years of the buy-to-let game, um, maybe even longer than that. Um, I've become increasingly aware in the last kind of three, four years or so about the expansion of um, uh, hedge funds and private equity funds and even banks into buying housing as an asset, that's been fairly clear. So I, you know, I understand that side of thing. I know a lot of people personally who kind of see the house not just as a home. I mean, they live in it, they don't rent it out, but they see it as a kind of a long-term investment. A, a kind of, I mean, they don't put it in this way, but as their as their main form of capital accumulation, essentially. I'm not altogether certain about this argument, though. I think there have been other things that have gone on in Britain and the rest of Western Europe and the United States as well over the last, say, 40 years, which have uh, you know affected the housing market. We've seen, for instance, an explosion of immigration. I, I think that's – I'm not – Making a judgment on whether that's a good or a bad thing, but it's been, it's clear that countries like Germany and Britain and the United States and Sweden, for example, they've all had extremely high migration into their countries. And that means more people to house. Um, and you know, another point would be that divorces are higher now. So instead of a, a man and a woman living together in a house with little Johnny, who you mentioned earlier on, um, now, increasingly, uh, the woman lives with little Johnny in one house and the man lives in another house. That means more, you know, more houses per man and woman, if you like. Um, and there have also been other things quite country specific. So, for instance, I mean, this has been quite a British centric program so far. So I hope our American cousins can bear listening to what's happening across the pond. But, uh, in Britain, for instance, in the 19, uh, well, after, from the end of the war until the beginning of the 1980s, the government used to build a large number of council houses, uh, local councils, uh, so kind of mun municipalities in American terms, used to build homes and then rent them out to people at quite a decent 
level. And at first, at least in the 50s and 60s, there were actually quite decent places, quite decent neighborhoods. Uh, it's not like kind of the projects in America, although increasingly those that are left are, but, you know, back in the day they were. And then in the 80s, Margaret Thatcher and her government, in their wisdom, um, gave all people who had lived in those council houses more than a certain number of years a option to buy them at significantly below market rate, I think a third of the market rate. Not only did that, I mean, in theory, that didn't increase or reduce the housing stock. It just kept it the same. It just gave ownership to the people who lived in them. But what it meant was that councils could no longer raise funds to build more council houses because nobody was going to lend to them if they were going to use that money to build something that the council was legally obliged to sell to you know, a third of its actual value. So, you know, all of these things have happened. Um, we don't have council house anymore. We've got very high immigration. We've got quite high divorce rates it, relative to the 1960s, whereas private home building has stayed roughly the same. Uh, I mean, in the 1950s, there was a lot of building in pro from the private sector under a conservative government, but that's another story. Is it not that, Philip? I mean, if I just dumped, you know, half a million houses or, or a million houses into the market every year that would lower the price wouldn't it surely supply and demand i mean it seems like a, a a reasonable argument and look as i said at the extremes if you if you massively increase or decrease the housing stock um yeah i mean obviously it would have some effect on prices i'm sure but i think it's just shown from the 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 you know two, three decades of rising house prices. And by the way, rising and falling, it's very cyclical. Again, supply and demand aren't that cyclical, but um, speculation is. Um, uh, what we've seen is that, the, is that the supply and demand just don't seem to, or the supply never seems to catch up. Now, that seems really weird. Why? Because, look, every time anyone talks about housing, it's like something that's like near and dear to people's hearts, like other investments or other markets aren't, I guess. And when people talk about it, they tend to talk about it relative to their own country. And then they can kind of dredge up the country-specific complaints that they have about regulations or NIMBYs or social housing or whatever. But what people are missing from this is that this phenomena is happening all over the developed markets. Housing price, uh, pr the, the way that you measure housing valuation is house prices relative to the average income in a country and house price to income ratios are rising everywhere across the developed world. Now, if these are idiosyncratic problems about home building, whether about civil servants not mark checking enough boxes to build uh, social housing, or whether it's about uh, onerous regulations which have grown up like tumbleweeds, like weeds everywhere, this is happening everywhere at once. Like that seems really unusual. This isn't Whereas it seems a lot less unusual to say that all these economies have been grotesquely financialized and everything's increasingly looked like an asset. The other problem is that nobody can show this with data. I mean, if you go and you start Googling about home building or about supply and demand in housing markets or anything like that, you'll get a million and one Google hits, right? And you'll click on the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth and they'll be well, well marketed, well designed study. Why is this? Because there's lots and lots of money in this sector. It's home building. It's the construction sector. So if you want to go and you're a think tank or you're affiliated with a university or whatever, you can. You can, it's not that hard as an economist to get funding to go and study the housing market or whatever, and you always come to the same conclusion magically. So there is a ton of money floating around out there for the studies, yet no one, I've never been able to locate evidence of this. Now, it shouldn't be that hard to do. What you do is you'd show that there is a correlation between uh, ha high house price to income ratios, um, so overvalued, overstretched housing valuations, and slow home building relative to population growth. Okay, that shouldn't be rocket science to do. So why hasn't anyone produced it? I'd say no one's produced it because it doesn't show the right result. Let me just give you some examples that I've pulled up just for the show, really easy to get. If you go and you look at house price to income ratios in selected countries, this is for the fourth quarter, 2022 by country, right? You'll find that in the top 10, 
of of the highest house price to income ratios in the world. So that's um that's the most uh that's the most overvalued places in the world. You'll find Hungary and the Czech Republic, just as two examples. I could probably give more, but these are just simple ones. Hungary and the Czech Republic have not seen positive um, population growth since the mid 1980s. Their population has not been growing. That includes immigration, that includes everything, since the mid 1980s. And yet, these housing valuations have gone to the moon. Now, to me, it's very obvious what that is. It's a new market of Central and Eastern Europe opening up and people who view these things as an asset getting very excited about them, going in and starting to buy them up, seeing them as high capital appreciation, telling themselves that this country is going to develop really rapidly, so we got to get in early. And at the beginning, it's probably a good investment. But as those house prices keep going up, it becomes a, a worse and worse investment. And at a certain point, the housing markets will probably will probably blow. And they'll probably blow all over Western Europe. I'm not saying they'll revert back to their normal levels of the 1990s. I don't think they will. But they'll probably come down, just as they did in 2008. What you're arguing, essentially, as far as I understand, is that house prices have risen, not just in absolute terms, but in in relation to the average wage in the country you know the you know the price to ra- the the price to wage ratio they've risen not because of any external issues to the market for instance the the number of people who need to be housed either through you know different marital structures or migration uh, it's not because of any kind of uh, supply side issues with regard to um uh, planning regulations or government housing construction it's simply because the market itself has somehow managed to suck in more money from uh, people who view houses as an investment rather than a home. And because it's sucked in more money, there's more money for the same number of assets and prices have gone up, essentially. It's a kind of classic case of that. But why did that happen? Why did that start? Like, why why does this happen now and not in 1962 in Britain? Right. Or like even 1972. Because, because number one is financialization. That starts in the 1980s and you've got a fairly overdeveloped financial system by the mid 1990s, which is when these house prices start to go crazy. Number two, low interest rates. Okay. You're only going to go into more exotic assets like mass pile into the housing sector in terms of private equity and individual buyers looking at speculative gains and rental yields if the rest of the financial markets are, are crap, if the returns are really bad. And how do you get really bad returns in financial markets? You drive down interest rates. That drives down the interest rate on the safe asset, which is usually a treasury bill or a gilt or whatever. And then when those interest rates go down, the stock market valuations go to the moon. Now, you can ride that train up, but it'll then mean revert at a certain point. What's really happening is, is when those valuations go up, buying at those very high prices, those price to earnings ratios in stock markets becomes a very risky venture. And so people don't really like doing it. So they start going into these alternative asset classes. So that's what it is. Financialization and and um, low interest rates. And behind that, lying in the background of financialization and low interest rates, the real structural tectonic forces there, some of them, I'm not saying all, are increased income inequality. Those are the big pools of capital accumulating with with people who are richer, uh, richer relative to their peers, and also aging populations. You've got lots of mums and dads, banks of mums and dads, that have to go out and deploy their capital. I'm not saying that that explains all of the low interest rates. It doesn't. It's a really highly complex phenomenon. It has to do with deindustrialization. It has to do with many, many things. But part of it is certainly just that the baby boomers which were the biggest population group that we've seen since, I don't know, 1920 or something like that, certainly in existence today and certainly in existence in living memory. That group have now aged. They've accumulated all their savings. They're like 60 on average, I think, or something. Average baby boomers are at 60 or something like that now. So they've done all their savings. They're pretty much retired and they have these big wads of savings. And so they're looking for places to, to put them. And we know it. I mean, the UK, it's called the bank of mum and dad. You get mum and dad to buy you a property in your name, but it's really a speculative financial asset for them because they don't want to put any more of their money in stocks and bonds. Off the hooku.
in the last week or so, there has been some limited reporting that the uh, Chinese uh, province of uh, Jiangsu, and apologies if I'm butchering the pronunciation there, but the Chinese province of Jiangsu has started the process of relaxing its uh, huku laws. Huku laws are rules that essentially restrict the free migration of Chinese citizens within uh, China by curtailing their social benefits and their access to property outside their place of registration. And it's not easy, per these uh, huku laws, to register somewhere new, especially in a, a big city or an urban environment. So why is this important? Well, as is well known, as we've discussed a few times here on the podcast, China has a demographic problem. Uh, its fertility rate in 2022 was 1.09, which is way below replacement level. It's actually more a, a long way below half of replacement level. And because of that, uh, the overall size of, the, of China's population is uh, forecast to contract quite significantly over the next kind of 50 to 70 years or so. And that's obviously an issue for a whole range of reasons that are well known, so we won't get into here. However, as we've discussed in the past, and, and, and we did a whole special episode on, on Peter Zahan's ideas and theories uh, a while back, so people can listen to this. And, and one of the, 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 the arguments that Peter Zahan makes most prominently is that because of China's demographic issues, it's going to go into long-term secular economic decline. However, we at the podcast think that that is a very simplistic way of looking at things. And in fact, just because the overall size of the population might contract, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to go into long-term economic decline. And one of the reasons that we argued for that is that when it comes to economic growth, what's most important is the number of urban workers, because urban workers tend to be much more productive. They tend to work in, in factories or in the financial sector or in a, in industry of some type, whereas agriculture tends to be much lower productivity, much lower value add. So it's not so much the overall size of the population, but the size of the urban workers that, oh, not the size of the urban workers, but the, the number of urban workers that, that really counts. And on this metric, China has actually got quite a lot of room to expand economically. It, it, it's actually only, believed or not, you know, we see these pictures of these huge Chinese cities with, you know, 20 million people living in them. But actually, it's only the 121st most urbanized country in the world. Only 61% of the Chinese live in an urban environment. Now, if you compare that to, say, the UK, which is the 51st most urbanized country in the world. And 84% of people live in an urban environment. So, you know, almost 25 percentage points more in Britain live in urban areas than in China. But even if you look at the United States, which still maintains a really big agricultural sector, I mean, it's, it's one of the main food exporters in the world and it's got a large population, which it, it, it feeds easily, perhaps a bit too much. The US is the 54th most urbanized country in the world, and that's uh, got an 83% urban population. So China has got a lot of room to expand. And one of the arguments we made was like, look, if China wants to mitigate some of the impact of its low fertility rate, now there are all sorts of things it can do to address that low fertility rate, to actually solve the problem at source. But if it doesn't, and just wants to mitigate the issue, it can just accelerate urbanization. It can just accelerate the process of urbanization. And in fact, it seems that that's what it's doing with the relaxation of these uh, huku laws, because what that would do is it would make it much easier and much more attractive for rural uh, workers to go and work in the city. They'd be able to get access to social benefits. They'd be able to get access to property. They'd be able to stay. They'd be able to move their whole family rather than being just migrant workers and working in the, the toughest, less secure jobs. They'd actually be able to go and make a life there. And that would actually mitigate some of the issue with the, the overall decline in population by countering it with increasing the size of the urban working population. So I actually think that although this hasn't really been covered much in the press, and even though it's been 
you know, covered through the prism of these Huku laws themselves and, 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 and you know, some of the communist hangover uh, and, and also the current economic situation. I think the big news about this is that it, it, it should help China's long-term economic prospect. Yeah, it's. I mean, I think of it like um, immigration without the downsides of immigration. I mean, it's effectively immigration. I guess you're losing some rural population, but that's probably not too, too big a deal. And it has all the upsides and, and none of the downsides. And as you say, there's an enormous pool uh, to draw from here. I think my kind of baseline attitude with all things China is don't write them off in terms of their ability to plan. Um, I'm not saying that mass planning of economies and so on is a good idea. If it goes too far, you see what happens in the in the Soviet Union. But I think having a, a for example, a five year strategic goal being set uh, that isn't tied to an election cycle is a pretty powerful tool um, for stuff like this on variables that you can control. So my kind of instinct is to think that you shouldn't probably write off. China, um, China's capacity to do to do these kind of things a priori anyway. The other issue is that a lot of their problems are due to this kind of uh, uh, controls that they've put on their population. On the demographics question, it always drives me crazy because it feels like we're we're throwing uh, stones in a glass house ourselves. I mean, I'm uh, I do a lot of work on on demographics and so on in the West, and the, the the statistics are absolutely dire. They're they're terrible, and people don't really realize that. For example, the United States and the United Kingdom haven't had below replacement level birth rates since the early to mid 1970s so that's um I, i'm pretty sure china had a has a substantially higher birth rate in the early 1970s in the united kingdom and the united states of course we've we're we say well we're able to plug that gap with immigration well that'll reach limits and i think we're actually probably pushing up against those limits as we speak um, and China, of course, now have this kind of internal immigration that they can do. So that kind of aspect of it's always driven me crazy. But the other point to be made, the kind of general point, is that our problems with demographics aren't the result of policy, not in any explicit sense. I mean, I guess you could say when the, when they took the bans off selling contraception or something, that, that was the underlying cause. But I think that's a little bit murky. I think it was probably the invention of the contraception itself. The demographic problems that we experience are driven by individual choices. I'm not saying that the, the Chinese birth rates aren't driven by individual choices. They are, in a sense, but there are kind of policy hangovers in place. I'm thinking of the remnants of the one-child policy there. I'm also thinking of the fact, which is not widely appreciated, but abortion is extremely common in China because it's effectively used as a means of contraception. That, again, is a hangover from the Mao population control days. And so it, it in theory, when you look at the, at the setup there, you say, wow, there are probably a lot more levers to pull to try and, and jiggle this population problem than there are in the West. Because in the West, frankly, and I think about it a lot because I write on family policy and so on, you really would have to get people to fundamentally change the behavior and choices that they're making. I'm not saying that's impossible, but that's a lot harder than just lifting the ban on two, three children or um, perhaps uh, trying to cut down on uh, the utilization of abortion for contraceptive means, for example. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I, I think we should kind of not look at China like, oh, well, they'll definitely solve the problem. But I think we should take a very nuanced look at it. And we should also just be very cognizant that the Chinese know this problem ex exists and they are fairly determined to solve it. Um, we know the problem exists in the West, and we still haven't come to a consensus on if we want to solve it, let alone how we want to solve it. I think that's right. Uh, on the Chinese rural population, I, I think one of the reasons that it has had traditionally a very high rural population is kind of tied into some of the ideology of Maoist communism and the and the agricultural worker and the centrality of the agricultural worker to some of that, uh, but also their concerns about you know, feeding a billion strong population, right? Like you, you probably want to, to have quite a, a large uh, agricultural workforce to be able to do that. Uh, but these days it's fairly clear if you read the literature that there's an enormous amount of room to make Chinese agriculture much more efficient. And the easiest way probably to do that would just be to get more rural people to move into the cities so that some of these farms could consolidate, 
They could build up enough capital to invest in, in productivity, improving, um, plants and machinery and the rest of it. So, uh, you know, this process would actually probably help the Chinese agricultural sector become more efficient itself. Um, so as you say, it's almost like, it, it, it's almost like having the benefits of migration with fewer of the, uh, drawbacks. I'm not going to say none because some of these cities, I mean, I mean, one of the reasons they maintained these, uh, huku laws to start with was because they were concerned about the development of slums in uh, Chinese cities and the ability of uh, infrastructure in the cities to keep up with the explosion of population. We see all over the developing world that as countries urbanize, you get these huge shanty towns or favelas or townships emerging on the edges of cities uh, because they simply can't keep up. The infrastructure is always terrible and, and, uh, and the rest of it. So the, the Chinese wanted to avoid that. And, and, and so they've got to, you know, they'd have to put a fair bit of work in to expanding infrastructure and expanding the housing stock, I guess. But at the same time, this is all, these are all things that the Chinese actually want to start doing again now, given that, you know, while growth hasn't been as, as, as dire as perhaps it's made out in the West, it, it still hasn't met, uh, Communist Party of China expectations and targets for this year since the reopening after COVID. So this is something that they want to do anyway. So it might kill lots of birds with one stone. Um, I also think you're right with regards to some of the issues China has. Clearly, the low birth rate is at least in part about the one child policy that was held in place for a long time. There are loads of policy levers that they could pull with regard to this, whether it be lifting the the child limit restrictions, whether it be curtailing the amount of abortions which take place in China, which is uh, is a large number, and and we've seen uh, certain authoritarian countries in the past do that. Most famously, Romania in the nineteen uh, eighties banned abortion completely, and also giving incentives for people to have kids. I mean, the the Hungarians do it, and the Russians do it, and several other countries do it as well. Now, you know, I don't see why. The, you know, the Chinese would be short of cash to do something similar, especially as they want to rebalance the economy more to domestic demand and, and the consumer side of things and a little bit away from export and manufacturing. Um, the, you know, that's one of the big problems that China has at the moment. So maybe one of the ways that they could do that is by shoveling money in the form of various incentives to people who have kids. Who knows? But I think this is one sign that the, 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 the kind of the loosening of these huku laws is one sign that some of the, the Chinese doomsters are really quite wrong and, and, and almost primitive in their analysis when they say, ah, you know, the fertility rate is low, demographics look really bad, therefore inevitably we'll get this mechanical decline in economics. Well, if you look a little bit deeper than skin deep, that ain't necessarily the case. And I think these huku laws are evidence that things aren't going in that direction. We've loved giving you free multipolarity, and we hope to continue doing that for a long time yet. But from here on out, we're also going to be offering a premium version alongside that for the real heads. From next week, the 24th of August, every month, we'll be offering at least one exclusive episode of Multipolarity every month behind a paywall. Just go to Patreon, sign up for our $5, £5, five euro tier. Sign up is easy, you can cancel any time, but you don't have to. Just search for Multipolarity of the Podcast on Patreon and be among the first to help us chart the rise of the new multipolar world order.